Good morning, everyone. I just pray that you're having a good day. Let us uh, go to the Lord in prayer and then get started. Father, thank you for this beautiful morning. Thank you for another day, another opportunity, Lord, to be sown into. Father, I pray for the hearers and the hearts, Lord, that as this word goes forth and as we begin to break down the word and the scriptures, God, that the hearing uh, would move upon the hearts and then we would put feet to our faith lord and go out and do what you are charging us to do lord we love you today and we bless you and we praise you in jesus name we pray amen good morning and welcome to another his international ministries a week of consideration for application this morning we're going to take a look at the text that we preached on last week from colossians the third chapter of paul speaking to the church at colossi entitled um, Christ Our Carnality. So we're going to take a look at that sermon this morning. Um, as we went back over the sermon and looked at it, as we always do, decided that this particular sermon will indeed take two weeks to examine. But we think that is critical for your growth. Uh, one of the things that this ministry prides itself on is equipping the body of Christ. James 1.22 says, be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. In order for us to be able to do the word of God, we must first understand the word of God and how it applies to us, um, how it impacts our lives and has the potential to impact the lives of others through us. So consideration for application is our way, is one of the methods that we use here at His International Ministries um, to equip you to be able to do the word of God and not just hear it only. Amen. So this morning, we're going to go ahead and get started again. It's out of the book of Colossians, the third chapter, verses one through 17. And we'll begin to break that down. Um, I'm going to read to you out of the Amplified Bible. Just go through those 17 verses real quick and then we'll go ahead and begin to break that down. Uh, again, thanks for joining us this morning. We love you. OK, Colossians three, one through 17, Amplified Bible subtitle. Put on the new self. Would offer that this morning for your consideration as we go through the breakdown of this lesson. Put on the new self. Therefore, if you have been raised with Christ to a new life, sharing in his resurrection from the dead, keep seeking the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind, keep focused habitually on the things above. The heavenly things, not on things that are on the earth, which have only temporal value, temporary value. For you died to this world and your new real life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. So put to death and deprive of, deprive of power the evil longings of your earthly body with its sensual, self-centered instincts, immorality, impurity, sinful passion, evil desires, and greed, which is a kind of idolatry because it replaces your devotion to God. Because of these sinful things, the divine wrath of God is coming to the sons of disobedience, those who fail to listen and who routinely and abstantively, abstantively disregards God's precepts. And these sinful things you also once walked when you were habitually living in them without the knowledge of Christ. But now rid yourselves completely of all these things, anger, rage, malice, slander, and obscene, abusive, filthy, vulgar language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, for you have stripped off the old self with its evil practices and have put on the new spiritual self who is being continually renewed in true knowledge in the image of him who created the new self. A renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek, Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, nor between nations, whether barbarian or Scythian, nor in status, whether slave or free. But Christ is all and in all. 
So believers are equal in Christ without distinction. So as God's own chosen people who are holy, set apart, sanctified for his purposes, and well beloved by God himself, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, which has the power to endure whatever injustice or unpleasantness comes with good temper. Verse 13, bearing graciously with one another and willingly forgiving each other if one has caused uh, for complaint against one another, just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you should forgive. Beyond all these things, put on and wrap yourselves in unselfish love, which is the perfect bond of unity. For everything is bound together in agreement when each one seeks the best for others. Let the peace of Christ, the inner calm of one who walks daily with him, be the controlling factor in your hearts, deciding and settling questions that arise. To this peace, indeed, you were called as members in one body of believers and be thankful to God always. Let the spoken word of Christ have its home within you, dwelling in your heart and mind, permanent, permeating every aspect of your being. As you teach spiritual things and admonish and train one another with all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thanksgiving in your hearts to God. Verse 17, whatever you do, no matter what it is, in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus and in dependence on him giving thanks to God the Father through him. The word of God for the people of God this morning. Now, as we begin to break this particular message down, Christ our carnality, for those of us, those of you who were with us last week, you'll recall that we started out by talking a little bit about slavery, that which we find appalling, that which none of us would, would sanction, none of us in our right minds, none of us that has the kind of love that Paul talks about in Colossians for other people, whatever sanction, whatever approve of. Slavery comes in many forms. We talked about that last week. We talked about um, forced marriages um, as something uh, being servitude type of slavery. We talked about those that are, that are being sold, human trafficking. We talked a little bit about that. Uh, we, we tend to think of slavery um, in terms of people. When we say slavery, what immediately comes to mind is you think of Africa and the African slave trade and those kinds of things, um, and that's what comes to your mind. But slavery is such, a, it has such a broader definition and an even broader connotation if you begin to think about it spiritually, which is what we want to consider today and, and which is what that message was designed to do to create in your heart and in your mind the thought of how the expanse of slavery, if you will, and, and its spiritual connotation in your life, the spiritual impact that it potentially has in your life. So that's what we're going to look at this morning. Having looked at slavery, we talked about the purpose of slavery in its most basic form is to rid oneself of work and force that hideous labor on to someone else. 40 million people in bondage in Asia, forced labor in the Gulf states or the Middle East, child workers and soldiers in Africa. We talked about the fact that Colossians is broken down into six sections, and the section that we focused on was the hortatory section. Hortatory is just a fancy word for encouragement. Paul, in this particular section, is encouraging us to an action. He's encouraging us to, do, to not do some things, and he's encouraging us to do some things. He's encouraging us to take off some things. He's encouraging us to put on some things. So hortatory just a fancy word for saying Paul is encouraging you in this particular section. And that's the section that we wanted to focus on today. What is Paul encouraging us to do? Paul is urging the Colossians to a course of actions. He's exhorting them. He gives warnings to them about some things that are detrimental to their spiritual growth and their spiritual relationship with God. He's telling them to remember the things that they have been taught, which is, is a point that should be well taken for us today. 
We want to remember those things that we have been taught through the word of God, through the scriptures, if you will. So we begin in that particular section, the hortatory section. We begin in that particular section, and we begin at the beginning. And, and Paul, in his Colossians 3.1, he says this. He says, therefore, if you have been raised with Christ to a new life, sharing in his resurrection from the dead, keep seeking the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. He says, Paul is encouraging them to continually, to habitually seek the things which are above. The Colossians church was faced with some things that have begun to creep in and challenge Christianity, if you will. It was, it was things that were caused to distract them, to pull them away from Christianity, Judaism, the worship of angels, those kinds of things that were going on in the church. They were creeping in. Um, and distracting some of the people away from some of the things that they had learned, the Christianity, the faith, the principles that they had learned. Well, today it may not be worship of angels for us. Today it may not be Judaism for us. But the question begins, the question that we, that's posed this morning, the question that we have to answer this morning is what are those distractions? What are those things that, that creep in? that cause us not to live the kind of life that Paul's encouraging the, the Colossians and indeed us to live this morning. What is it that creeps in that causes us not to take off the things that Paul is instructing us to take off and fail to put on the things that Paul is telling us to put on this morning? Oh, uh, we're going to insert this morning. We're going to insert the 21st century church into the Colossae scenario this morning. So he begins with that particular verse, and he begins with heavenly aspirations. He tells us aspirations being those hopes, those ambitions, the, the thought of achieving something, an aspiration, a goal, if you will. So what are those aspirations that Paul is encouraging us to do? He's asking us to continue to see. He's asking us to, for this to be habitual, habit, if you will. Practice, right? So what is he asking us to do here? In this one, he begins to talk about seeking. But first and foremost, he makes a comment in the very beginning that we need to take note of because he, he actually makes a comment here. He says, he says, therefore, if you have been raised with Christ to a new life, sharing in his resurrection of the dead, keep seeking. Paul, in essence, in his comment, gives a precondition kind of deal to the continual seeking. He connects the fact that, that those being raised with Christ through his death, burial, and resurrection, those that identify with Christ as their Lord and Savior is what Paul is saying, right, for us today. For those of us that have been raised, because if you identify with Christ, then you are dead to sin, and you, you are a new creature in Christ, Corinthians tells us. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So one might ask the question this morning, well, have, have we been raised with Christ or not? So glad you asked that question. That question is answered in the church, in, in the letter to the church at Ephesus, in Ephesians. Ephesians 2, 6, and it says this, And he raised us, not will raise, could raise, potentially raise, but just like Paul said, if you have been, Ephesians tell you, tells us that we have been. And he raised us up together with him when we believed and seated us with him in heavenly places because we are in Christ Jesus. That is going to be crucial as we move on in breaking down this particular message. And you'll begin to see why. And you'll begin to see very clearly why that is so important. While we understand that we are indeed raised with Christ, we're not physically seated in the heavenly places at this particular time, but we are spiritually, we are seated with him in heavenly places from the time that you accept him as your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that's going to be very, very important as we walk through that message. So we want to lay a little bit of foundation this morning so that when we walk through that message, you'll be able to understand why this is so important to us this morning. So he tells us, he tells us, he says, these are your aspirations, these are your hopes, these are your ambitions, these are your goals. 
to continue to seek the things that are above. Because again, there's a lot of things going on on the peripheral for the Colossian church, just as it is for us today. We are distracted by many, many things. Some of our own uh, self-initiatives, some things that are beyond our control. But we're distracted by many, many things today. And you can identify those things in your, in your life specifically. But the urging, right, the encouragement this morning, the exhorting this morning is to keep seeking the things which are above. Ephesians has established the fact that we have indeed been raised with Christ, right? 2.6, we're going to go back and take a look at Ephesians 2.6 and 2.19. We want to break this down a little bit, and we're going to take a look at 1 Peter 2.11. We want to break this down a little bit because there's these particular passages of scriptures begins to develop a relationship that is as important as us understanding that we've been raised with Christ is to understand the relationship we have with Christ having accepted him. And that's going to be important as we move forward. So if we take a look at Ephesians 2, 6, we, we go in the scripture we just read, and I want you to take note of some things. <clears throat> I want you to take note of the number of times that the word us, the personal pronouns, us, him, we, are mentioned, and we're going to draw some, some connection. We're going to draw some correlation this morning in terms of relationship that is being established here that we need to know. So it says in 6, and it says he, capital H-E, he raised us up. We are raised, who raised Jesus Christ? God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. So he, capital H-E, God raised us up together with him, right, when we believe and seated us with him in heavenly places because we are in Christ Jesus. Us, we equates to us, the believer. Him, Jesus Christ. Him, God. So we begin to see this relationship because we were raised up and seated with him because we're in Christ Jesus. We've accepted Christ Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Verse number 19, Ephesians 2, 19. So, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, outsiders without rights of citizenship. But you are fellow citizens with the saints, God's people, and are members of the household of God. So now we begin to see some of the benefits of being raised and being seated in heavenly places. Now we begin to see some of the benefits of being in Christ Jesus. This is important because we have to know, we have to know who we are. Are. We can ill afford to have an identity crisis here in the earth. Scripture tells us that we're in this world, but we're not of it. And I think a part of the problem with us and a part of the problem with the Colossians church is we fail to believe and we fail to understand where our citizenship lies. Where our citizenship lies. We tend to rely more on our earthly birth certificates than we do on our heavenly rebirth, our heavenly citizenship, our heavenly position, if you will. It's easy to take on the things of the world because we happen to be physically in the world. You have to begin to, to have a paradigm shift. You have to begin to shift the way that you think about where you are and who you are. And whose you are. So it's important that we know who we are. And we're going to divide that in just a second. 1 Peter 2 and 11. Beloved, I urge. Here he is again. He's encouraging again. He's exhorting again. Hortatory again. He said, beloved. This is Peter. Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers in this world to abstain from the sensual urges, those dishonorable desires that wage war against the soul. He counterbalances what Paul tells you 
in Ephesians 2.19, Paul says that you are no longer strangers. You are no longer aliens. Paul begins to make the connection to our heavenly citizenship. Peter comes back in turn and says, you are aliens. You are strangers. And he makes that connection to the world. It's important, folks. We have to know who we are in the kingdom. And that is citizens with rights, fellow citizens with the saints of God, members of the household of God. That's who we are in the kingdom. But equally as important, we have to know who we are in this world. In this world, we are aliens. In this world, we are strangers, right? We have to disregard it. We have to put off those sensual urges of the senses. We have to put that off in order to be able to put that on. But the beginning of that is the understanding of who you are in the kingdom, a citizen seated with Christ, and who you are in the world. You're an alien, you're a stranger, but we don't live, oftentimes we don't live that way. Oftentimes we live that, that the way that we are citizens. We take residence here, citizenship here. We look at naturalization of citizenship, birth right here, and we fail to see the new birth. We fail to see the new generation that comes about as the result of accepting Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit and regenerative forces in our life. We fail to see that. We fail to understand that, if you will. But the importance is we begin to see the, the us, we as believers and the he, him as, as God and us being in Christ and then the heavenly citizenship that belongs to the individual that accepts Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. You're now a new creature in Christ Jesus. Old things have passed away. So it's a mind shift for us, right? Carnal mind will never be able to wrap its, mind, wrap its arms around that. Right? You can't wrap your carnal mind around that spiritually discerned through God. But this is the word of God for the people of God. So now that we understand who we are in the kingdom and now that we understand who we are on the earth, because they're really diametrically opposed, they're opposites. They're at the opposite ends of the spectrum. We kind of live like Peter said we aren't, and we kind of don't live the way that Paul said we are, which is interesting. So that's a shift for us. We go on, and Renee, we're going to let you jump in here in a minute. We go on to Philippians 3, 12 through 21, and we begin to look at verse number 12. And it says, and this is Paul, he says, Not that I have already obtained it, this goal of being Christ-like, or have already been made perfect. He said, I actively press on so that I may take hold of that perfection for which Christ Jesus took hold of me and made me his own. Verse 12, what Paul is saying is, and Paul's talking about salvation. Paul's talking about that, that, that mark of, of living the Christ-like after experiencing God, after accepting Christ, of living that Christ-like. He says Christ-like behavior. But he says that Christ has made him his own. He begins to recognize heavenly citizenship. Paul recognizes who, whose he is and who he is. And that's important for us. But what is this press that talk, Paul's talking about? Paul's talking about the way that he lives. Paul's talking about the way that he lives. Paul says, I, I, so that I may lay hold, he said, I press. He said to the, to the Colossians church to keep seeking. Essentially what Paul is saying, Paul is saying, I'm pressing here. It's to keep seeking. It's the continual seeking. It's the habitual seeking is what he's talking about. So what is Paul's press? Paul's press is the seeking things that are above. It's the same thing that he told the Colossians church. That's what it is. So we look at that and we move on to 13 and it says, and he starts in 13, Stealing in Philippians 3, he starts in 13 and he says, brothers and sisters, I do not, he continues on with that thought. He says, I do not consider that I have made it on my own yet, but one thing I do, 
he says, forgetting. Now he begins to get in specifics. He tells us before that he's pressing. And he tells us what he's pressing to. But now he says, forgetting what lies behind me and reaching forward to what lies ahead. We are not physically seated now, but that's what lies ahead. So Paul says, for what lies ahead? He said, I press toward the goal to win the heavenly prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Paul had a lot of things to forget. Paul was trained by the best educators, a Pharisee, well-to-do, well-educated man, a man of, of authority, a man that persecuted the church with success, I might add. But he said, all of these things, all of the things that I have attained outside of Christ, all of the accolades that I've been given in my life, he said, I forget all of that stuff. I forget all of that. Why is that pertinent to us today? Why is that important to us today? Because so much of who we are, so much of what we hang our lives on is wrapped around our accomplishments, the, the goals in our lives. We, we tend to create a sense of identity. And I'm not saying that necessarily that's a bad thing as long as it's not exalted above our pursuit for heavenly things. Our identity is in Christ. Not in, in the accolades we receive or the awards or the degrees or the promotions. That's not where it is. Again, heavenly citizenship. Paul begins to describe here his hopes and his ambitions. He begins to describe what he wants to achieve. In other words, all of those other things that I have achieved, mm -mm, that's not it. That's not it. I have new achievements is what Paul says. And then he goes on after describing some of these aspirations that he has. He begins to go on in 17 and he's, he addresses the church again. He said, brothers and sisters, he says, together, he says, follow my example and observe those who live by the pattern we gave. That's the pattern of righteousness. That's the pattern of godliness. That's the pattern of seeking heavenly things. He says, he says, for there are many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears who live as enemies of the cross of Christ, rejecting and opposing his way of salvation, whose fate is destruction, whose God is their belly their worldly appetite, their sensuality, their vanity. He says, and whose glory is in their shame, who focus their mind on earthly and temporal or temporary things, but we are different, he says. Because our citizenship, here it is again, our citizenship is in heaven. Paul is on the earth when he speaks this. But he says we're different. He says because our citizenship is in heaven. And from there we eagerly, eagerly await the coming of the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul addresses those that oppose the cross. He says they reject and oppose the way of salvation. He describes them as enemies of the cross. Now think about that for a minute. He's talking about people who are pursuing, who have worldly pursuits. He says the appetite, their appetite is the appetite of their belly. They're selfish. They don't have an appetite for pursuing the things of God, they have an appetite for the things of this world. That's pretty powerful that Paul would say that these folks are enemies 
of the cross. Enemies of the cross. Think about that for a minute. So he begins to deal with those that oppose and reject the way of salvation. He connects their worldly appetites and sensualities as a barrier for pursuing heavenly things. Paul begins to address once again our citizenship, exhorting us to seek, exhorting us to have aspirations for things that are above. I had read in the sermon, the kingdom dynamics that talked about spiritual responsibility. It says the creatures that God created, the creature that God created in man is enabled, has the ability to, is enabled to respond to him, God. Man becomes response, man becomes a response able being. We are created to respond to God. He is qualitatively a different sort of being, man, endowed with ability and freedom to fellowship and participate in the life of God. You are free to do this. You have the ability to do this in God. You have the ability to respond to God. We are enabled. So then, if we are citizens of the kingdom, if we are enabled, if we are enabled, let's do it this way. If we are enabled to respond to God, we respond to God, we take on kingdom citizenship, then we must reject some things. We must oppose some things. And we must reject and oppose the right things. For we have the ability to reject and oppose anything, to include God. But we must reject and oppose the appetite of our bellies. We must reject and oppose that. We must respond in freedom to God. Because we've been endowed with that power. Renee, you want to jump in? Do you have anything? There's only one thing that um, is still vivid in what Chuck had been sharing. And unfortunately, I'm not a news person, so I don't watch it enough. But I know that there's been a major thing about uh, people from other countries trying to get in here. And so when you were talking about citizenship, all I, uh, that came to me and, and a lot of this is stuff that I am taking to Renee right now, so I'm just sharing. Is the line, you know, how they want to come over to America because that's the land of the free and the home of the great, uh, the, the home of the brave. So which line are we in? Are mm. we in the one that wants to come down mm. here and no longer be an alien here, but we want citizenship here? Mm -hmm. Why isn't there a line of people trying to get to the heavenly citizenship? Wow. A lot of that has to do with we're really not uh, portraying that it is a better place mm. because we're spending so much time in the line to break it. We want to be citizens here. I want my oh, stuff here. I want to stay good. here. I don't want to leave here. You know, I don't. We we look like the world. We're talking a good game, and I'm talking about me because that mm. really struck me. I thought, okay. So it, it, am I in the line? Am I trying to break into here? Mm. Which is an easy thing. We don't have any guards trying to get you here. The bait is calling you here. But which line are we standing in? And the one to heaven is the one I love what Chuck just said a minute again, a uh, minute ago. Uh, because we have the ability to do what God is calling us to do. So it all boils down to the choice mm. to do, Amen. to be a doer of the word or a hearer only. So that's what, um, you know, it's a lot of things speaking to me. I have a lot of notes, just not ready to share them with you because Holy Spirit's dealing with me. So that's all that I Amen. have. Amen. That's good, Nate. That's good. Think about that. Think about what she just said about that line. Consider that the number of people that want to come to the United States for the better way. Think about that. 
and, and what was critical, Nay, and, I, and, and thank you so much for saying this, as kingdom citizens, we're here in the earth for a purpose. Right. We're here in an earth, the, the earth for a purpose. If people aren't lining up, it's because we are not projecting that it is a better way. Why do people come? Because they can watch the news and they can see commercials and they can see, oh, the house on the hill and this and that here. They can see all the carnal things, right, that are that Paul describes as temporal, temporary, right? They can see all of those things and begin to desire those things. Well, what is it that our lives are conveying? What is, what is the light and the salt that we are supposed to be? How is that impacting people? How is that creating a hunger? And right. a thirst for righteousness in, in others. Because think about even when you say that, if we go to another country, there's something, whether it's the television or something, that are that is telling the foreigners that this is a better place. Absolutely. So we've Absolutely. been dropped down here as aliens, <sighs> right? Ah. And, and so what is it that we're bringing to ah. the table that's ah. saying to them, I want to go where they are. Wow. It, it's not looking like, it's a whole lot of draw um, that we ain't wow. seeing a whole lot to wow. encourage people to come over. Wow. Nay, nay, you're on to something, babe. You're yeah. on to something. Because when you say we're aliens and we're strangers, we right. don't live like that. Right. That's why people aren't hungering and thirsting for right. righteousness. We are living like citizens here in the earth. Being conformed. We are, we are conformed to the earth. We are yeah. living like citizens here. We're not living like aliens here. If we were, li if we were to live like strangers and aliens here, yeah. then we would be projecting that the better way. Yeah. That's it. If we would continue to seek, as Paul is saying, heavenly things, and, and aliens and strangers will do that, right? Come on. Those that are satisfied in their countries... Those that live in Europe, in Germany, and in Italy, and love their countries, they're not trying to come here. They're not trying to come here. Typically, a lot of a lot of immigrants coming from the third world countries, whose countries are ravished with war and hunger and poverty. Germans ain't trying to come here. Italians, a lot of them are not trying to come here. And many of us are not trying to go there. Right. Think about that for a minute. We're living like citizens here when we should be living like aliens and strangers here. Paul said, that's who you are. That's who you are. You're there, but you're just passing through. You're not a citizen there. You're not a citizen. You are an alien and you are a stranger there. That would help us make better use of our time in, in terms of being salt and light to others. Holy Spirit began to deal with me on this because we're talking, we're still talking about slavery and we're going to get to more of that as we go along. But the Holy Spirit began to deal with me on the idea of diplomatic immunity. Diplomatic immunity. What is a diplomat? A diplomat is just someone who represents a country abroad. If we, in fact, let's expand that definition to a heavenly perspective, if you will. If, in fact, we are aliens and strangers, but yet we are here and our citizenship is in heaven, that means we're abroad because we're not in heaven. We are representatives abroad. Bible uses the word instead of diplomats, it says we are ambassadors for Christ. Essentially the same thing. An ambassador is a representative of a country. Our citizenship is in heaven. We are indeed ambassadors. We are abroad. We don't live abroad. We live like we're home. But we are abroad. We are abroad. So what is it about this idea of diplomatic immunity? Diplomatic immunity, by definition, the privilege or exemption from certain laws and taxes <clears throat> granted to diplomats by the country in which they are working. Further definition of diplomatic immunity, and this is important. 
is the status granted to persons that exempt them from the laws of a foreign jurisdiction. The diplomat's country of origin has prerogative over whether or not a host country may prosecute a diplomat under foreign laws. Why is that important? Because we are strangers, we are aliens, we are foreigners, right? We have he heavenly citizenship, we've already established that, right? So does this earth, as foreigners, does this earth have jurisdiction over us in terms of the laws? And right now I'm talking about one specific law, the law of sin and death. The law that manifests in our actions, our pursuits. If they're not heavenly pursuits, if they're the pursuits of our own bellies, if they're earthly pursuits that typically manifest in sin. Because it's opposed, Paul just said, it's, it's in opposition to the cross. Op opposition to the cross manifests in sin. We know that the way Hebrew says the wages of sin is death. Right? So in its full manifestation, we see death. Paul just said it in Peter, that to their destruction. He said their fate is destruction, is what he said. Ah, uh, but I'm happy this morning. Because as a diplomat, the country of origin, the place where you have citizenship, has the prerogative to determine what laws you are subject to. Paul's going to show us here soon that we are no longer slaves to sin. Right? We don't follow the laws of sin and death. We don't follow the laws of carnality. Because our country of origin, heaven, our citizenship determines that. And we know that as heavenly citizens, we are free. A spiritual diplomatic immunity, if you will, as citizenships. Of the citizens of heaven. Go ahead, Nay. I see you wanting to jump in. Just wanted to say, don't lose that just here prior to coming to this diplomatic immunity, he talked about how, and I'll use my terms because this is um, something uh, real strong in me. God has given us the ability to do what he is calling us to do. So this whole um, thing where we act like we have to be sent to slavery that's already been settled in the word because you were just sharing it. Something back there, I heard it. And so everything that, as believers, when we come to Christ, we have the power to choose. So the question is, why are we still in slavery? It has to be choice. And so when we reconcile that and stop blaming it on the devil or this that's place good. where we're aliens walking That's around. Good. It's that being conformed That's and not good. being transformed. And we have to grow up That's good. and really take responsibility because we're choosing this. It's not because of God and it's not because we are not empowered to do it. It wow. is because we have settled down here as citizens and we like it. Yes. We like what they give and we like how we live and that's just what it is. Nay, that is so good and we're going to see that. Remember we just talked about we are enabled beings. Yep. We are created as, man is created as an enabled being. Go back to the garden in, in chapter 3 of Genesis and look, Adam and Eve have choice. They had the ability to respond to God or the ability to respond to sensual desires. They had that ability. So Renee is absolutely right. It's about choice. All of the power that you need to respond to God, you already have. You already have it. And if you're a believer, you're sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit. So you are endowed with power. Acts 1.8, he says, Paul said, Paul said dunamis. Yep. He said, wait until you be empowered, dunamis. We get the word dynamite today, du the dunamis power of God, right? The spirit of God. So we have that. So in looking at the question of diplomatic immunity, we're talking about citizenship. We're talking about foreign jurisdictions, right? And we're talking about country of origin. Well, Brother Chuck, come on. What, what do you mean about that? 
Well, folks, we just read it, and we're going to read it again. So you ask the question, what is my place of origin, right? What is my place of origin? John 16, 17 gives us an account and tells us um, where, where we live, where we reside, right? And we, and we just read it here in, in, um, in Ephesians 2, 19 gave us the same thing. It, talks, it tells us where our citizenship is. It tells us where our country of origin is. It tells us that it's heaven. Right? So there's no confusion there whatsoever. None whatsoever. We, we find that. So we find that again in John 17, um, 14. And I thought I had it here in my notes. I was going to read it to you. John 17, 16. you to read. I'm going to have Renee read it. I want you to read John 17 and I want you to read 14 first and then I want you to read um, well, you know what? Read read 14 through 16 for us. And this is John 17, 14 through 16 talking about our, our origin. Okay. John 17 starting at verse 14. I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, mm. just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, oh. but that you should keep them from the evil one. Verse 16, they are not of the world, oh. just as I am not of the world. You want me to read on? Nope, stop it right there. Renee, what color are those letters? Red. Who's speaking? Jesus. This is Jesus. Now, now we're not having, we're not recording the words of Paul. We're not recording the words of Paul. Now, this is Jesus himself in John 17, and he's describing the believer's origin. He's saying, and he's talking to the Father. He said, They're not of it. They're not of this world. He said, Now, I don't pray that you take them out because there's a reason for them being there. Renee just talked about. People lining up to come to the United States. Well, the desire of God is that people would line up. Yeah, that's good. That people would find him. <laughs> so Jesus said, I'm not praying. He said, Father, I'm not praying that you take them out. I'm not praying that because they have a reason for being here. But then he goes on into 16. And Renee, if you would read 16 again, and he just reconfirms what he's saying. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world citizenship remember he said that we are seated in heavenly places because of what because we are in christ jesus if we are in christ jesus and christ jesus is not of this world then how can we possibly be of this world can can let the word of god be true in every man a liar right so now we have jesus telling us where our origin is from right so the country of origin, your place of origin, your place of residence has prerogative over whether or not the host country, this world, right. whether the host country may persecute you under foreign laws. You're not under the law of sin and death. You're not. All right. Further on, on foreign jurisdiction, 1 Peter 2.11 and we just read this, beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers in this world. That's the foreign jurisdiction. That's not your residence. That's your abroad ambassador. <laughs> you're a broad diplomat. You are abroad. You're foreign. You're far. The foreign jurisdiction is this world. Peter's clear. Okay, then Brother Chuck, then what about the host country? Well, Ephesians 2.19. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, outsiders without rights of citizenship, but you are fellow citizens with the saints of God, the people of God, and are members of the household of God. Heaven ain't the host country. The world's the host country. The world is the host country in there. 
Your citizenship is in heaven. Heaven has jurisdiction over you. So if we say we have to live to sin, then all of that is a lie and all of that is a non-truth. And I'm here to tell you today that is not the case. We are not subject to the laws of sin and death unless Renee talked about choice, right? Unless we yield to the carnal appetites of our belly that Paul talked about. You have an option. You have a choice. You have free will. You can follow the instructions just as Paul was telling the Corinthians church, keep seeking the things that are above. Don't give up your pursuit of seeking the things that are above. This has to be habitual. This has to be a habit. This has to be the pattern of your life. It has to be. Or you can pursue, as the church at Colossae has started to do, the appetites of your belly. As Ephesians, church at Ephesus, appetites of your belly. But, but Paul is cautioning us today. Are we on time? We're just about 10 o'clock. You're good. So he goes on, having dealt with, having laid the foundation of, of who you are, whose you are, where you're seated, where you reside, where your origin is, having laid the foundation of citizenship and kingdom citizenship, he goes on to say some things that are pretty profound. He makes a, a, a connection here. He goes back. We go back to Ephesians 2.10. In Paul's writing, he says, For we are his, capital H, his workmanship, his own masterwork, a work of art, created in Christ Jesus. Before we learn, we're in Christ Jesus. Now we see we're created in Christ Jesus. Reborn from above, spiritually transformed, renewed, ready to be used. That's the reason why Jesus didn't pray that we were taken out. Ready to be used for good works, which God prepared for us beforehand, taking paths which he set so that we would walk in them, living the good life which he prearranged and made ready for us. His workmanship. Now that's a lot to unpack in Ephesians 2.10. But we begin to see the same thing that we looked at when we went to Colossians 3.1. We begin to see the personal pronouns. We begin to see we. We begin to see his. We begin to see us. We begin to see he. We begin to see God. We begin to see Christ again. So again, we begin to see that relationship. We begin to see that pattern again that we saw in Colossians 1.3. But he deals with this idea of workmanship. Workmanship being the Greek word poiema. The word signifies that which is manufactured, a product, a design produced by an artisan. An artisan being a specialist, an artisan being a worker, someone that works with his hands. Genesis, you can see the works of his hands. It emphasizes God as the master designer. The universe as his creations, and we see that in Romans 1.20. And the redeemed believer as his new creation here in Ephesians 2.10. Before conversions, our lives had no rhyme or reason. Paul said, you were once, you once walked in sin. That's pre-conversion. But post-conversions, we take on a new nature. We take on new character. We take on new citizenship. As God being, as, as us being a part of the workmanship of God the master creator, the master builder, the master artisan, if you will. So Paul begins to work this, he begins to work citizenship 
and workmanship together. He goes and tells us where we belong, who we belong to. And then he begins to tell us what we are. We are the workmanship of God. Right? Now here's what's interesting. He goes on to say, taking the paths that were set before us beforehand. No creator, no inventor invents something and creates something without a purpose. None of them do. Even if, it, even if they fail in the first attempt, they will continue to build, to, to change, to mold, to adjust until that product does exactly what they envisioned it to do. And here, Ephesians, is, Paul is telling us exactly that. He said, you're his workmanship created for good works, not to oppose the cross, but to glorify God, to honor the cross, to take paths, right? He said to take paths that he said, that the creator said, that the, that the master builder said. Not your own way, but the way that the designer, the master designer created you for. I had to take a look at Mark 2.17. And I'm sorry, 12, 17, and, and the spiritual leaders of the day were trying to trap Jesus, and they were, and it was a conversation on taxes. And they were asking the question, should we pay taxes? And Jesus, and he answered it with questions. He said, I'll tell you what, he says, whose picture is inscripted on the coin? Caesar's picture was on the coin. And this is what he said. He said, render unto Caesar what belongs to Caesar, but render unto God what belongs to God. If you are the poema of God, if you are the workmanship of God, if you are be have been created by God, and oh, by the way, Psalms 24, 1 says that you have been. Because it says that all things were created by God. But if you are the workmanship of God, then render unto God what belongs to God. Mm -hmm. If you have accepted Jesus Christ. Now, if you've not accepted Jesus Christ, that's not the expectation for you. Right? Because you that, that was the former state that Paul talked about. But if you have accepted God, if you have accepted Jesus Christ, if you are walking in the newness of life, if you have been regenerated, if old things have been passed away, if all things have become new, then render unto God what belongs to God. You are the poema of God. You are the workmanship of God. You are crafted. You are manufactured. You are designed by God. Render unto God what belongs to God. So then Jesus could ask the same question that he asked of the religious leaders. Whose stamp is on your life? Mm -hmm. Whose stamp is on your life? Because if you say, Jesus Christ, then you have to render unto God what is God's. Because he set a path before you were ever created. He said, the steps of a righteous man are ordered not by their bellies, not by their carnal desires, but by the Lord, by the Lord. Um, we're going to, we're going to finish this this morning. We're going to finish this section this morning. Paul began to deal not only with aspirations, but he also began to deal with affections. He tells us to continue to prove, he says, continue to seek the things of God. But then he goes on and he begins to deal with the mind. And he says, and he's talking about our affections now. He says, set your mind on things above. It's a consistent message with what he says about your aspirations, about your goals and desires. Keep thinking heavenly things. Now he's saying, set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. Now, Paul's speaking to spiritual mind and not a carnal mind. Because a carnal mind is not going to do that. A carnal mind is going to be in opposition to the cross as we've already learned, right? So he begins to deal with this idea of affections. 
he begins to lay, Paul begins to lay the direction of a life, of our life. And he says this, Paul begins to do this. Paul lays out two directions of life and shows their ultimate consequences is what he does. He implies that Christians have the ability to choose Renee. Renee's been talking about choice for the better part of the morning. We've been talking about choice for the better part of the morning. He says that Christians, he implies that Christians have the ability to, to choose to do what is uncharacteristic of a Christian. We have the ability to do what is uncharacteristic of who we are. Is what he's saying, namely, walking according to the flesh. And we receive a caution. Set your mind on things above and not on the things in the earth. The implication is you have the choice to do that. Even in the caution, the implication is you still have the choice to do that. But he warns about it. He warns them not to do it. We are actively to work at growing in holiness and putting to death any sin in our hearts and our minds. This was the press. This was a part of the press that Paul was talking about. He said, forgetting those things that are behind me. He said, I press toward the mark of the high call of Christ Jesus. Romans 8, 6 says this. He says, now the mind of flesh. Paul still writing. Now the mind of flesh is death, both now and forever. Because it pursues sin. But the mind of the spirit is life and peace. The spiritual well-being that comes from walking with God both now and forevermore. First John 2.15 says this. It says, do not love the world of sin that opposes God. And his precepts. Here it is again. Nor the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Think about that. Mm -hmm. Now, not only do we have the potential of opposing the cross and being in opposition to God, now, 1 John is telling us that if the love of the Father is not in us, if the love of the world is in us, then the love of the Father is not in us. Matthew 6, 21 begins to deal with treasures, that which we have affections for. Our house, our car, our jewelry, our diamond rings, anything else that we exalt above God, our pets, you name it, our children, you name it. The things that we treasure. Matthew begins to deal with it. He says, where your treasures are, they're your heart, they're your affections is also but if you back up and you take a look at 19 it gives us a caution in that same text matthew 6 19 says do not store treasures on the earth where moth dust and rust does corrupt and thieves break in and steal in 20 it says store up for yourselves treasures in heaven this is the first section of consideration for application for Colossians, the third chapter. Folks, today it's about your aspirations. What are your goals? Are you, are you continually seeking the things that are above? It's about our affections. Where are our treasures? Because where our treasures are, it's going to tell us where our heart lies. It's going to tell us where, it's going to tell us something about our affections. We've received encouragement. We've, exceed, we've received exhortation today, but we've also received some cautions today from Paul. Yeah. We've learned where our country of origin is. We've learned where our citizenship is. We're not subject to the law of sin and death. We've been freed from that. But we still have the choice. We still have to do that which Paul called uncharacteristic for the believer. And that's to pursue the things of the world. We learn what the pursuit of the world ends up in. 
our destruction, our demise, our frustration, our anxiety, mm. ill will toward us, if you will. We've been given the pattern. Paul says, live according to the pattern which we gave you. Colossian church. The same appeal is being made today to the 21st century church. Live according to the pattern. Live according to the word of the Lord. Live according to. That is section one. Nay, do you have anything in closing? <laughs> The only thing that I wrote down, and I'm glad you came back to hear, this is the question or the consideration. Are we using the laws of the place that we have allowed ourselves to be conformed in and then expecting the laws of heaven to work on our behalf? My God. I'm going to say yes in many circumstances. And that is where the breach is. Um, Chuck was just sharing, he said, frustrations, anxieties. For those of us who are dealing in those areas, those things are working in us right now, whether it's the state of the world or the state of home or some situation. Mm -hmm. It would do us well to review mm -hmm. If we've been conformed and we're expecting the God on high to do what he promised according to our movement into citizenship on him, mm. we don't move God by our rules. Oh, and, and again, he is sovereign. My God. He is sovereign. My God. So if we are citizens mm. of heaven, Mm. and aliens of earth mm. if you have an expectation if we have an expectation and I believe that we have in many instances that what we're doing down here according to the laws of the earth are going to make what he's promised on heaven to operate it, it's not, it, that's why it's not working, mm. that's why we're not seeing God's hands move mm. his hand move, that's why we're not seeing power and demonstration that's why the light is dim on earth, because we are taking what we, <coughs> excuse me, what we're comfortable with, what we're enjoying, that belly thing, what we've been feeding, and then we call on God and wonder why we have not seen his hand. That's a lot to consider. Mm -hmm. That's a lot to consider. That's good, and that's, that's, that's all that I have. Amen, Nate. Thanks, babe. That, that is so good, Nate. Thank you so much. Listen, we're going to close this particular segment. Um, we're going to rejoin this segment next week and begin to continue to go through Colossians, the third chapter. But I want to encourage those of you that are out there this morning and perhaps you've not accepted um, Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Today is a marvelous opportunity to do that. All the rights and the privileges that, that belong to believers are the rights and privileges that God wants you to have this morning. And, and I'm convinced today that if you would, in accordance with Romans 10, 9, and 10, if you would confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, and if you would believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, the Bible tells me that you shall be saved. Because with your mouth you confess the Lord Jesus Christ, and in your heart you believe that God has raised him from the dead. And if that's you this morning, and if you're willing to do that this morning and accept the Lord as your Savior this morning, um, we're going to encourage you to link with a ministry that teaches and preaches the Word of God, that you might grow and that you might be equipped and that you might be empowered to do the work of the, of the Lord. Remember that Jesus said in John, he said, Father, I don't pray that you take them out of the world because there's a work to be done here in the earth. And God is using believers all across this earth to still fulfill his will and purpose, and he wants you to be a part of that this morning. Listen, we love all of you today. Um, we give God the praise, the glory, and honor for you, and we're going to take you out with just a short prayer. We want to thank you again for joining us today. Father, I just thank you this morning for this time together with you. Lord, we believe by faith that your word will not return unto you void, but it will accomplish that which you purpose. Lord, I pray this morning that the word of the Lord has found its way into fertile ground, 
Lord, I pray that you would cultivate the hearts and the minds of your people today, that you would give, give them, stir up the fire and the desire yes. to pursue heavenly yes. things, O oh God. Father, I give you praise, glory, and honor that we will be doers of the word, that we will walk in the steps that you have ordained for us, and that we will bring glory and we will bring honor to you as we pursue heavenly things, as we set our mind mm -hmm. on things that is above. I ask that you would bless all of those under the sound of our voice today. We give you praise, glory, and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Have a great, Have a great week. week.